Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, we are going to establish a seemingly random potpourri of derivative laws, properties, formulas, rules, etc., etc. And let's start off in uh, start off in some spicy territory. Start off with trick. What is a derivative formula for the derivative of sine and cosine? Let's start with uh, sine. The derivative of cosine, again, let's uh, fall back on our limit definition, cosine of x plus h minus plain old cosine of h, oh my gosh, I meant to say x all over h. Well, uh, that first term, that cosine of x plus h, seems uh, unwieldy at first, but I can apply my trig identity, sum and difference formula, to rewrite that fraction like so. I have three terms in the numerator, but that first term and that third term both have a cosine of x in it. So I'm going to move them right next to each other and divide by h. So you know, no mathematical difference, just a, a reshuffling. And now that one big fraction, how about we break it up into two? We break it up into two like so. Uh, the first term has the numerator with the cosine of x's in it. And now we are going to just distribute the limit using our limit law, using our limit law. So there we are, just uh, business as usual. But now, look at the cosine of x in that first fraction. In this limit problem, our variable, if we're taking the limit as h goes to zero, not x goes to zero, h goes to zero, then for all intents and purposes, x and x terms are just constants. So I can pull out that cosine of x from the first fraction, I can pull out the sine of x from the second, uh, because once again, uh, for these limit problems, it's h that's varying, it's h that's getting closer and closer to zero, and so everything else that's not h is a constant. And upon yanking out the cosine of x and the sine of x, I'm left with some very familiar friends. That last one, he's our special trig limit involving sine, that is a simple one. And the other limit very closely resembles 1 minus cosine of h over h, the limit of that, of course, is 0. So how do we get to match? Well, just a little clever trick. Just factor out a negative 1. When I pull negative 1 out of cosine of h minus 1, I get 1 minus cosine of h over h, and then I pull out that negative 1, and I am left with something that exactly matches my special trig limit. That guy is zero. So overall, I have zero times cosine, negative cosine minus sine, which is minus sine, negative sine of x. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine. Who would have thunk? Again, what this means is that if you're to pick any point on the graph of cosine, the instantaneous slope at that point is just sine of the x-coordinate with a negative sign thrown in it. So for example, if we pick the point uh, pi over two, zero, on the graph of cosine, the instantaneous slope right there is negative one, negative sine of pi over two. Who would have thunk? Who would have thunk there was such a nice slope reporter for the graph of cosine? It's just negative sign. It's nothing really complicated. Um, hopefully we get a similar result for sine. Let's, uh, intuition tells me that we will. Hopefully we will. So proceeding like usual, apply the limit definition of the derivative, and um, yeah, apply the sum and difference formula for sine, move the sine of x terms next to each other, break it up into two fractions again, just like before, exactly analogous. And then we distribute, then we distribute the limit to both fractions with a plus sign in the middle, and then we factor, factor, factor. So it, it resembles it resembles the previous derivative almost to a t. It's just uh, in this case, I'm factoring out a sine from the first fraction and a cosine from the second one. Um, so I'm left with this. Once again, he is one, and once again, this guy, for similar reasons, is zero. And we have cosine of x plus zero or just cosine of x. So once again, 
the slope at any point on the graph of sine of x is cosine of the x coordinate. Again, who would have thunk? Who would have thought that these things would turn out so nice? So if I want to find the slope, for example, the point uh, 3 pi over 2, negative 1, you know, visually, of course, it's 0, but we can confirm that because cosine of 3 pi over 2 is 0. And that's all there is to it. Now, continuing our random uh, foray into derivative laws, formulas, properties, here are two very important derivative formulas. This first one's called the power rule. Um, it goes like so. The derivative with respect to x of x to any real number is n times x to the n minus 1. So, for example, the derivative of x cubed is 3 times x to the 3 minus 1, or 3x squared. The derivative of x to the square root of 2, because these don't have to be nice numbers, they can be any real number, it's going to be root 2x to the root 2 minus 1. They can be fractional exponents as well. 1 third x to the 1 minus, 1 third minus 1, or negative 2 thirds. And finally, our second formula, the derivative of e to the x, it turns out that's just itself, e to the x. We're going to prove these fellows really rigorously later, but for now, let's have them in hand. They give us some nice shortcuts for uh, doing derivatives. All right, let's uh, migrate on over to some key, some key derivative properties. We're going to have three of them. Let's start uh, start with the first one, and let's suppose in all these uh, all these rules that f and g are differentiable functions, i.e., you can take the derivative. The derivative exists everywhere on the domain of the function. Well, the derivative of a constant, if there's no x term in it, it's just a constant, it's just zero. The derivative of three is zero. The derivative of sine of pi squared is zero. Precisely because when we graph them, f of x is three, f of x is sine pi squared, they're gonna be horizontal lines and the slope of horizontal lines are zero. That's just the intuitive reason. We'll prove it rigorously with limit definition here in a second. But for now, let's list the remaining two properties. Property number two is just saying that if you're taking the derivative of a sum of things involving x or a difference of things involving x, you can break it up into its parts and then add up the derivatives of the parts or subtract the derivative of the parts. Uh, likewise, just analogous for limit stuff, you know, um, if you're taking the derivative with respect to x of c times some stuff with x in it, you can pull out the constant. You can pull out the constant and then just take the derivative of the stuff that has an x in it. All right, let's prove the first one rigorously with limit definition, even though we've seen the intuitive reason. Let's let our function be uh, c. We apply the limit definition. Well, f of x plus h and f of x are both going to be c. It's a horizontal line. So we have c minus c over h, 0 over h, limit of 0 being 0, and we are done proving statement number 1. That's how we do a rigorous proof. That's how we do rigorous proof, ladies and gents. Number two is a bit, uh, a bit more prickly. Let's let k of x be that entire plus or minus some difference of f and g. So, limit definition of that guy, i.e. the derivative of that entire sum of that entire difference, whichever one we're dealing with, is as follows. Now, I want to drop those brackets. But if I drop those brackets, I need to distribute that minus sign to that plus or minus in the second one. So that's why you see a flipped minus plus. Now I'm going to bring the f's next to each other, the g's next to each other, and now notice. I'll put brackets, um, but before I do, notice that the plus and the minus have to go together, and the minus and the plus have to go together, and that same thing will happen if I just stick a minus sign in between the g of x plus h and the g of x. Positive times negative is negative, and uh, negative times negative is a positive, and that will regenerate what we had earlier. Now we just break it up into two fractions, limit each one, and notice these boxes are the definition, the very definition of f prime and g prime. Very definition. So now we've shown that all that stuff up there is f prime plus g prime. The derivative of f plus the derivative of g. Likewise, let's prove number three. Let's let our big function k of x just be c times f of x. So the derivative of c times f of x, derivative of k, apply the limit definition. Apply that limit definition and stick a c in front of the f's now. 
And now we have a limit. And after factoring out the C from the F's, we can factor out the C from the limit. We can pull it right on out. And what we are left with, once again, following the same pattern as number two, is the very definition of F prime, the very definition of df over dx, the very definition of the derivative. And there we have it. So that's these properties abstract, but what can we do with them? Well, let me tell you. Let's, let's try this example on for size. I can break this up into uh, three derivatives using property number two. And property number one lets me pull out the seven and the pi. Like so. And by the way, the root x is the same thing as x to the one half. And now to each of these guys, I can apply my rules. The first one and the third one, I can apply the power rule. Middle one, I can apply my very first thing I proved for cosine, and I get this as my derivative. Now what it allows us to do that is, uh, you know, the properties. Now, pause the video and try this one on your own. Okay, so once again, applying property number two, we can break this up into three derivatives. Property number one lets us pull out the negative pi and the three, and then the formulas we learned so far let us find the rest. Well, almost. That first one, power rule, middle one, trig rule. But be very careful. E squared is a constant. It don't, don't do 2e to the 2 minus 1. That's a very common mistake. That's not right. This is what we want circled in violet. Now, onto our next order of seemingly random business, but once again, it's, this stuff is going to coalesce into a coherent whole eventually. Here's an alternative definition of the derivative evaluated at x equals a. So let's start with the previous definition of the derivative evaluated at x equals a, i.e. f prime of a. What we did to find f prime of a is we uh, you know, picked our point of interest and drew secant lines through it. And we labeled the second point on the graph that the secant line passed through a plus h and uh, f of a plus h. Which of course gave us a secant line slope like so, but here is the alternative definition. Rather than labeling that second point uh, a plus h, f of a plus h, we're just going to call that second point a generic x comma f of x. So pick any point on the graph, call it x comma f of x, and draw secant lines through it. Now notice, when we scoot that secant line back and back and back and back, you know, well first that's the slope. Just, you know, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Now again, let's, let's recap how we found the tangent line slope. We took those secant lines and scooted them back. We let h go to zero previously. But now we're not going to let h go to zero, we're going to let x approach a. So again, look at the graph, visualize and see that if x gets closer and closer and closer to a, the secant line will become, gets closer to becoming the tangent line. The slope of the secant line gets closer to becoming the slope of the tangent line. So this is our alternative definition box with a gold star. And now what I'm doing here is just proving to you that you can take your pick. You can take your pick. You can do either one of these methods and you should get the same thing. So here I did the previous method for a equals one and I got a tangent line slope of two. Well, I did the same thing again. It looks a little, looks a little weirder. It looks a little different for sure. But if calculus is not broken, I should get the same number. So x squared minus one over x minus one. I can factor that top. Cancel, cancel. Aha. One plus one is two. So same answer either way. So you can take your pick, and I encourage you to practice both methods. Some problems are easier with. Uh, one definition as opposed to another. All right. Now we've talked about how functions, you know, cannot exist. Now let's talk about three ways the derivative of functions cannot exist. So the three ways for a derivative of f to not exist at some generic x coordinate a. First is that well, f is just not continuous at x equals a. If it's not continuous, then it's not differentiable there. To see why we can deal with uh, you know either form of the derivative, um, that one or that one, 
what I'm boxing here, again, remember, these are slopes of secant lines. And the very concept of a derivative was passing a secant line through a f of a, and then scooting it back and noticing what the slope of the secant line was approaching as it got closer and closer to the tangent line. But again, it all started with passing a secant line through a f of a. Well, hold on a minute. If we have a hole at a f of a or a vertical asymptote at a f of a, well, first of all, we don't have an a f of a. <laughs> it's discontinuous. So we can't even form the secant line to begin with because a f of a does not exist at this hole and at this vertical asymptote. So let's deal with our final discontinuity jump. Now here a f of a it can exist. We can have a nice solid dot at one of the jumps. Um, however, uh, the analysis is going to show something uh, something different. Remember, we are finding an overall limit. Anytime you say limit as h approaches zero, that implies the right limit and the left limit exist and equal the same thing. So let's find the right limit and the left limit for this graph. In other words, I'm picking points to the right for my right limit. And look, I'm forming secant lines. And those secant lines are always horizontal lines. That's what you just saw in red. They have a slope of zero. However, what if I start forming secant lines from the left? So there's one secant line, there's another, there's another, there's another. But I'm never quite reaching the x coordinate of a, so th those slopes are approaching positive and infinite. They're getting infinitely steep. In other words, left limit does not equal right limit, so the overall limit doesn't exist, and so our derivative doesn't exist. So the function has to be continuous for the derivative to exist at that point. Well, that last example actually segues nicely into uh, vertical tangent lines. If a vertical tangent line exists at a f of a, then we say a derivative does not exist there. The derivative value does not exist. So notice, here's a graph of x to the one third. You guys know from foundations, it looks like so. And now the slope right at zero, zero, right where it hits the origin is infinite. That's what I've drawn in pink with a tangent line passing through it. It's infinitely steep. Slope of the tangent line is infinity. But remember, limits only exist if they equal finite numbers. So the limit of my secant line slope, the definition of the derivative, can't exist because that limit is not a finite number. It's infinite. That's why vertical tangent lines are said not to have derivative values there. By the way, notice if you take the do the power rule with this guy you'll get one over three times x to the uh, to the two thirds. And if you stick zero in there, you'll uh, get undefined. All right, third and final way, we can have a cusp or a sharp point at a f of a. So here are some graphs of the sharp point. Just think of them as a sharp point, absolute value type thing, uh, other stuff. It's just off, off the cuff. Um, one reason you might think that the derivative doesn't exist at that sharp point is because well, where in the world is the tangent line? How in the world do we draw a tangent line at a sharp point? Seems like I can draw infinitely many. Um, but let's argue a little more rigorously. That's a, that's a good intuitive argument, uh, but the more rigorous argument proceeds via the limit definition of the derivative. Like I did before, let's find secant lines starting from the right. So notice the slopes of these secant lines that I'm drawing in yellow, getting closer and closer and closer to the point, these slopes of these secant lines are always positive one. Slopes of those are always positive one. That's the right limit of my difference quotient. However, if I do the left limit of my secant line slopes, left limit of my difference quotients, those slopes and those segment lines in pink those are most definitely not one. They are negative one. And they're always going to be negative one no matter how close I get to that sharp point, precisely because it's a sharp point. So the left and right limits don't match. Therefore, the overall limit doesn't exist, which is the derivative. That derivative is the overall limit. 
By the way, this argument's gonna hold true for any sharp point. It doesn't have to be absolute value. It can be, uh, well, anything. And that's what I'm illustrating here. Slopes of the secant lines will never match. I also noticed that uh, two and three, uh, properties two and three, even though the derivative didn't exist, the function itself was continuous. So three ways. However, what if uh, what if we were we were to do a disc discontinuity problem or not discontinuity problem? Um, we wanted to show that the, the derivative value did not exist at a point without being allowed to draw a graph of the function. So here I have the absolute value of x minus one. I want to show that f prime does not exist at x equals one. And just for just for kicks, I'm going to go with the alternative definition of the derivative. So here I'm just setting them up, setting up the left limit, setting up the right limit. Notice that guy there is zero. And this is a familiar boy. He looks like so. He just keeps popping up. Just keeps popping up. Uh, we know from uh, last unit that this guy equals negative one. And exactly analogously, the right limit of the slope of the secant line of the difference quotient. Same thing, f of one is zero, leaves me with the same thing, and uh, again, I get one using my graph. Left and right limits don't match, therefore the der overall derivative does not exist. Again, f prime of one is that difference quotient limit, is that secant line limit. So, f prime of one doesn't exist. And we showed that without graphing the absolute value of x minus 1. Now then, let us, uh, let's see here. Let's end on a admittedly very spicy note. Let's prove the power rule for whenever n is a positive number, positive whole number. We don't know enough to prove it for negative numbers yet. We don't know how to get enough how to prove it for non-whole numbers, but we can prove it for positive whole numbers. We do know enough there. I apply my limit definition and get something like so, but notice, notice that first term. What can we do with that? X plus H to the N. That is just so random. Or is it? Notice what I'm doing here. I'm uh, raising X plus H to a uh, power starting with zero, then going to one, and I'm explicitly labeling the coefficients of each term. One, 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 two, one, for the third power, uh, one, three, three, one. And these are the entries in Pascal's triangle. Those coefficients are given by the n choose r notation, as we guys learned from foundation. So that was the basis of the binomial theorem. Again, where uh, n choose i is given by that up top, n factorial over i factorial times n minus i factorial. Now, if you don't like the summation notation, you can write it, you know, write out the first few terms, like so. Do a dot 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 plus, and end with the last two or three terms. This is what I've done here. So, no, I've just gotten rid of that weird summation symbol. Uh, and also, just... So this is going to be important. Notice that n choose 0, because 0 factorial is 1. That's going to be 1. Now let's use this guy in blue to write a long numerator. A long numerator for my difference quotient. Long numerator for my slope of the secant line. There's the x plus h to the n, and I'm subtracting an x to the n from that. And notice the x, minus x to the n's, they kill each other off. So my fraction becomes this. And every term of the numerator has an h, so I can cancel, 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 cancel. And after that little cancellation soiree, the only term that doesn't have an h in it is the first term, that n choose one times x to the n minus one. Prime time to plug zero in for h, and so every single term, every single one except for that first term, becomes zero. 
there he is. What is n choose 1? Well, I'll tell you. It's going to be n factorial over n minus 1 factorial times 1 factorial, which is just n. And so we have derived our power rule here in a nice blue cloud. That's the end. So admittedly, quite a whirlwind tour of uh, derivative laws, rules, properties, and so forth, but these are going to become very crucial when we get to more complicated derivative problems, complicated word problems. So everything we've discussed in this video, very, very worthwhile to know. Very worthwhile to know. Peace.